This episode of Around the Layout is brought to you by Highball Graphics. For over 25 years, Highball Graphics has been providing high-quality decals for railroads in New England, Canada, and beyond. With over 2,000 sets in scales N through G, Highball Graphics has you and your project covered. Highball Graphics specializes in custom decal orders, serving freelance railroads worldwide. Check out their easy-to-use website at highballgraphics.com or email them at info at highballgraphics.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Around the Layout, where model railroaders come to tell their story. My name is Ray Arnott. So glad you could join us. On today's show, we have with us Lance Minheim. Lance, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ray. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. I appreciate the opportunity to to talk to you today. Boy, I just, uh, I, I don't think I had a notebook thick enough to write down all the notes of the things that we wanted to talk about in an hour's time. So uh, <laughs> there's just so much to cover with you, and and uh, I want to I want to roll right into it. And it, it's great that you're here because, uh, and the timing is perfect, because as, for the podcast, I'm rolling into the one-year anniversary of, of the show. And about a year ago, I had this idea for this one-on-one interview format, and to provide a forum for all types of model railroaders to share their story. And throughout the year, I kept debating, you know, the, the, what is around the layout? What is this podcast? And, and what's the, what's the general thing that I'm trying to grab? And I just, as it, as it progressed and as we interviewed so many great people, it finally came back to me and it just it hit one word and it's the same word on page four of your book model railroading is art and it's in big letters at the top of the page and it's why and i just love the why you know there's a lot of guys that cover the how and you certainly cover a lot of how to do but that why part is just so fascinating to me and and it's so different for all different types of people what their why is in model railroading so i'm looking forward to talking to you a bit about that and your philosophy that you've built in model railroading. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun to talk to you about that. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Let's let's, before we get to all that and the, the books and the, the, the content you've created and obviously the, the beautiful layouts that you've built, let's start in the beginning. Where did your journey in model railroading begin? It was a pretty uh, inauspicious uh, start. I think a lot of times, you know, a lot of, you, you look at somebody and think, oh, they just rolled out of the womb and they were, they were just slapping this stuff together from the start. And it was, uh, it was kind of a, a slow and, uh, rocky road. And I guess when I was eight or nine. Um, uh, my parents just out of the blue had this idea that they were going to build a model railroad for me. And, yeah, they're spo- they're both still living in their nineties and Henri, but they, and they have no recollection of this at all. But it was so vivid to me that uh, they built this eight by ten layout, uh, paper mache for the scenery, painted this electric green and sandpaper for the streets, and that was back in the day where they had uh, the Athern blue box. And uh, I remember going with my dad down to the hobby store to pick up the you know, the old Athern blue boxes. And, you know, I had a blast with that. And like any eight year old, I spent a fair amount of time putting military figures on the track and running them over and, you know, just doing that type of stuff. Um, But at that age, you know, in that era in the sixties, hobbies were huge. And, you know, I talked to my, my friends from that period and, uh, you know, we were just excited we were all exposed to so many things and model railroading was just one that kind of came and went. And I would tell, you know, any parent, just expose your kids. You don't know what's going to stick. And if they're not interested in model, if they give it up at age 10. That doesn't mean they're not going to come back to it. So, um, so eight, nine, 10, we had this, uh, had this layout. And then I guess it went into the dumpster. I was on to the next big thing. You know, who knows what it was, slot cars or whatever. And, uh, we moved overseas for two years and honestly, Ray, I have no idea why, but we walked into a hobby store and I picked up a magazine and I was just instantly drawn to it. I have no clue 
why. And that was at the age where you had um, the V and O series was coming out. And uh, I just, I was just passionate. I mean, I would just pick up any, uh, any magazine I could, uh, you know, reading through them. And I started putting cars together, um, which were God awful. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the, the stuff back then, it's pretty funny. I, and I do say, I do have a few pictures. I like to post them because it's important to, but the thing I'm, I, the thing is I did jump in and, you know, I was immersed in the hobby. And so, uh, we got back to the States and this was, the, and I wrote about this in one of my books is the worst thing my dad could have said. It's like, you know, we've got this big basement, it's 20 by 40, um, I don't really use that much of it. I'll tell you what, you can have half of it. So here I'm at age 16. I've got this, uh, well, this is half of this huge basement. And I was so excited. I had no direction, no theme. And by God, I didn't even have a track plan, but I knew that I was going to hand lay my track because I was so excited about this. And I started on this massive disaster of a layout that if I – if I could have a poster child for being ill-conceived, it was it. This thing was just, and I write about it, it was just, uh, it was enough rope to hang myself. It was just awful. Um, but I kept plugging along. I was still uh, still interested. And it, you know, one side road we can, uh, we can talk about, and I'm sure this applies to a lot of people, is just how a ch- chance encounter with the right person can totally change uh, – the direction of your life. And I think if there's one thing I've been lucky is I've always met the right person at the right time. So I'm 16. I'm interested in it. And I had this childhood friend of mine who I'd known since I was seven or eight, Richard Koenig, and uh, still keep in touch with him. And somehow in high school, I mentioned that I was into trains. And he said, well, I am too. We've got this... um, uh, model rail, uh, a rail fan club at Indiana University. It's open to everybody. Would you like to join? I was like, I am so into this. And there were some big names in it. Uh, Gary Dolzel, Lon U. Daly, whose brother, is it Kevin who owns White River? Um, so yeah. you had all of these uh, smart guys that were so passionate. And we would go out in the field and they would say, okay, set your camera here, set it on this F-stop. This is what bracketing is. Do this, do that. And you know, when you're 16 or 17 and be able to hang with the college guys and that are that smart, Ron Potch was a um, graduate student that also worked for Illinois Central. And uh, God, I was just in hog heaven. So I was spending a little more time on the rail fan side of things. Um got some great photos, great friendships, which we still, we still keep in touch and we still laugh about some of these stories, but, um, this is starting to sound like the brat pack of like model railroading before they hit it big, right? You've got all these Kevin Udaly, and then you mentioned all these in yourself and you're all hanging out. That's, that's all I can kind of imagine. You guys are just like, you know, the, the, here comes the, 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 the brat pack of model railroading all hanging out together and learning how to take photos. That's, that's pretty wild. Yeah, it was actually it was Lon Udaly is Kevin's brother. I just talked to him okay. uh, a couple of months ago. It wasn't that glamorous. It was we took this trip, and it's funny how when you're young, the things that you think are so cool and so fun, there is just no way in heck you would do them now. But we had this idea that we would go on this week long rail fan trip in a Winnebago, and there is no way in hell you would get me in a tin can like that now with seven other sweaty guys for a week. But we were just to me, that it was like the best. Well, then Richard apparently got car sick. I don't remember this, but Lon was telling me about it. So then he got car sick, and they call it the the whole thing was the uh, the barf mobile. And so, <laughs> and then I was talking to Kevin U. Daly from White River, and he goes, "Oh, yep. you were on that the infamous barf mobile trip." So I, somehow that became famous. But um, and then I think like a lot of people. It was time to go to college, and uh, you know, for whatever reason, I just went cold. I mean, just totally dropped it. And 
college curriculum was pretty challenging. And then, you know, the professional side, I was separated from all my friends that were giving me the kind of the energy I was. And so I just totally was out of the hobby. Um, I think in my mid twenties, I had a ill-conceived layout. I was kind of dabbling with it. Um, Howard Zane was near. I remember seeing his layout, but, um, you know, I was a pretty, uh, I wasn't that involved in whatever I was putting together was total trash. Um, and then, uh, for whatever reason, when we were in an apartment, I had this idea that it was again, not a great idea to have a shelf layout of the Monon railroad in one of the rooms, but we needed to use the room. So I had the, Tom was talking about his elevated, uh, you know, we're laughing about his layout on pulleys and what a terrible idea that was. Well, mine was equally bad where <laughs> the only way to get it in the room was at eye level. So if you sit on a chair, you could photograph it and look fine, but it was just totally impractical. Yeah. So uh, I don't know why the thing kind of came together. It was not that great. And I wrote a letter to model railroader, took some cruddy pictures, put it in an envelope, mailed it to him. And I heard back and they said, yeah, we're interested. And my editor at the time was Jeff Wilson, which is kind of cool. He's still my, uh, we're still in touch. He's still my editor. Um, yep. So he must have been in his 20s back then when I was too. So Jeff, much more diplomatic than I said, what he was trying to say politely was, Lance, you're so, you're, we like your idea, but your photos just absolutely suck. They're unusable. So, <laughs> okay. but he, he, he polished it. He didn't say it that way. He goes, can no. you shoot him again? And then I did. And he came back and said, um, what he communicated, he was much nicer about this, but it's like, you're beyond all hope with these photos. We're going to send somebody out. Um, a guy named Paul Delcos to shoot the layout. And he goes, why does that name sound familiar? It seems vaguely familiar. It's like, the reason it sounds familiar is he's done like a third of the magazine covers of all time. So, so Paul came out and photographed the layout and uh, we just became friends and he invited me into his group. Um, and that goes back to just always being lucky to meet the right person at the right time, you know, with Richard Kona getting me into the rail fan group. And then um, I went over to Paul's house and they've got a really good network of modelers here with Paul, Bernie Kapinski, Marty McGurk, um, John King was living here for a while. And I remember going over to Paul's house and having him explain, you know, just how he did the scenery on his layout. And it was the weirdest thing, Ray. It just like, all of a sudden it was like, oh, I understand how to do this now. I understand how to really do a great model now that you've explained. It was just the weirdest thing. I remember like it was yesterday, him explaining you know, how you use a light touch, scene composition. It was only like a 10 minute conversation. Right. Um, so from that, things started coming together. Um, I built the Monon layout, um, flogged that for all it was worth. And then uh, things started uh, picking up from there. When the prototype of the Monon when they shut that down, Seaboard Coastline and CSX, and made it into a rail trail, for whatever reason, that just kind of killed my enthusiasm. Right. And then uh, I had always been toying around with the Miami thing. And uh, again, my luck continued. For a year, I knew I wanted something different, something of a Miami theme. And I just could not figure anything out. And I was writing to friends and nothing they were coming back to me was working. So I was at Cocoa Beach and I was giving a presentation. <laughs> and again, it was like lightning strikes. It was a small group, like 20 of us. And I said, all right, I'm just going to throw myself on the mercy of the crowd. And at the end of the seminar, I said, yeah, I'm trying to find a Miami theme. I'm getting nowhere. If anybody has any ideas, I'd be uh, helpful. So this guy pulls me aside at the end, David Orr who was um, at the time an executive for CSX in their mechanical department. He was a vice president. And he just started explaining everything that was going off in my, on Miami. He said, this is what you're looking for. And then his friend, Bill McCoy, who was in sales, 
just these stories, they just painted this picture of the Miami rail scene. And David said, um, I'll tell you what, when you get back, check your mailbox, you'll get an envelope that has absolutely everything you could possibly need. And I got back and two days later, there was this inch thick envelope of maps and diagrams and uh, things just kind of took off, off from there. And then it kind of, I think Tom's uh, recollection was pretty accurate. I decided to do a blog, which was one of the better decisions I've ever made. And I was just puttering around with it. And I think I remember Tom contacting me and I don't, I don't even remember, but he, I do remember him. He said, if you need any photos, <laughs> um, I'll be happy to send them to you. <laughs> so it's all about Lance. I'm like, yeah, this is my new best friend. So, yeah. <laughs> so I took him up on that. His photos yeah. were amazing because the one thing about that Tom understands that most photographers don't is the best photographer is the one that always has his camera with him, right at, at all times. So whatever Absolutely. you never know when a situation is going to present itself. So um, we started corresponding, and then I was down there taking pictures. Um, and as he told you, I went over to his house, and then you know we just became friends from there so uh i want to i want to talk about photography with you for a second and kind of off tangent but back to what you had said and and, and something i'm kind of picking up on and i kind of got it when i was reading this copy of of model railroading as art and it, it's funny because it was sitting on my bookshelf i actually borrowed it from joe mammy and it's been borrowed for a, quite a long time i mean he's probably going to want it back at some point <laughs> But it was actually sitting, and it's kind of funny, it was sitting next to all my Scott Kelby books. If anybody's not familiar, Scott Kelby is a pretty well-known photographer and, he, and an educator in photography. And it's kind of funny it was right next to it because from what you're saying, it seems like maybe photography led you down the path that you are now. Like It, it was like photography kind of clued you into you know, the, the style and this uh, theory that you have for model railroading, because they, they both go right together, the scene composition and cropping. You use a lot of terms that that book right next to this one with Scott Kelby is talking about scene composition and cropping and making decisions. So it, it, it's really neat that they really go hand in hand. I would agree with you, but not from the... Not from the angle that you're coming at it from, Ray, because I would say the okay. prototype photography, um, it's very inspirational. But I'm fascinated by photography and you know the artistic aspect uh, that goes with it. But um, what I want to talk about more was model photography because just the, the nature of our subject is that we can never see – trains as we can as a rail fan and i think for most of us it was the it's the rail fanning that brought us here in the first place right. and when we walk into a layout we're three feet above it um you know the models are small and even if we get down and squint it's not the same so we can right. never get the same experience but the way out is through the camera lens and so through the magic of the camera we can then experience our work and interpret it and modify it, um, you know, and just bring a whole new, new dimension to the hobby. We can see it as if we were um, rail fans. So I think that it's, um, you know, it's a vital aspect of the hobby. And the reality is, I mean, how many layouts can we actually see? I know, you know, we know people that travel a lot, but for the most part, the only way people are going to see each other's work is through photography. So it is vitally important. Absolutely. I just, I, I see some, you know, even, even with that, or if you're shooting, you know, prototype, but when you, even when you're shooting your model railroad, I, I always try to shoot my model railroad as if I'm a, a rail fan, you see. And I think you, you, you talk about that in, in, in your book here that, you know, shooting, you know, shooting down like you're a drone in the 1940s isn't going to ever sell to anybody. You know, it's like, it, you know, get that low perspective. And I always try to think like if I was a rail fan, at this site uh, or this scene or what, how would I shoot this and, and just kind of take that same aspect to it. And that's, that's kind of, I think what you're saying, you know, that delivers that, that realism to it. And we have so many more tools than we did uh, back in the day. Although I would argue that, you know, it's a shame that Kodachrome has gone because I mean, th that was just a magical uh, medium, but um, yeah. 
the challenge is that even with a single lens reflex, I measured this. If you lay, you know, if you put your SLR on the layout, it's still too high. Um, it's like 12 feet above the rails. So mm -hmm. um, unless you have a shot where you can drop the camera below the fascia, you still have a problem. And the out is the iPhones, which are getting better and better by the year, because if you can get those in position, now you're back at the four and a half feet um, that you would used to be seeing. And through these, uh, the magic of helic and focus, where you can get everything in focus, um, you know, it really yep. gives you the opportunity to, um, you know, put some interesting compositions together. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Focus, focus stacking and, and all the tools that are available now are just amazing to, to be able to put put a com composition together. A great photo that that sells for sure. And I was I, I do have to give a, a nod to somebody who probably doesn't even remember me, but the best teachers are the ones that don't pat you on the back and just kind of slap you down and give you a reality check. <laughs> sure are. So I don't. Uh, but but not in a troll like way. I mean. Uh, in a helpful way. So I don't know if you remember, it was a long time ago. I think it was in one of model railroad planning or something. There was a, an article about an O scale layout, uh, photographed by this guy named Bob Sobel, S O B O L. And I mean, his stuff was like him and Rob Enrico, I think are the two best rail photographers of all time. So being the pest that I am, somehow I tracked Bob down and said, um, yeah, I've been wrestling with this photography for a decade. I'm not happy with it. It looks like crap. Um, can you help me? And so he started working with me. And somehow we got on the, the subject of fluorescent lights. And like everybody, it's like, oh, you know, I, I've been through all the numbers of I got these high CRA uh, color match lights. And he goes, Lance, if you continue to talk about these fluorescent lights, I'm just going to end. Just going to end the conversation now because it's. I can't help you. It's just like you cannot get a good photograph under those crappy lights. So, do you want me to help you, or do you know everything? So, <laughs> so, so then uh, I shut up, and he sent me these really long emails. Um, the gist of which is taking a good photograph is 95% moving lights around and messing with the lighting and 3% actually pushing the button. So, uh, right. He, Bob Sobel, he has a, uh, it's on smug mug, you know, he has some tutorials, but, um, he was an enormous, uh, uh, help to me when it came to be being a better photographer. Well, it's amazing. The, the connections you make, you know, I've, I've repeated it multiple times throughout the podcast of, you know, it's amazing what will happen when you just extend yourself out a little bit. And it seems like you figured that out very easily to, you know, to, to, to write a letter or to, to reach out and ask and just amazing, you know, just, just got to reach out. There's so many people willing to help. I think, and this may not sound the nicest thing to, to say is I get a lot of those letters, but I try to, in my mind, I'm always saying, does this person want to know how to do it so they can apply it? Or are they just curious? Because there's a difference in terms of um, those that really are going to take the information and apply it and really want to learn, you'll spend more time with. Those that are just casually asking a question, It's you want to be polite, but it's just not worth spending that much time getting into it. Right. Well, but it, 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 in turn, you know, they're reaching out to you, but it, just in general, like when you, when you ask for legitimate help and you're willing to accept help, whether whoever it be, it seems like this hobby is just full of people willing to help in one shape or form, whether if you refer them to a book or you refer them to whatever, or you help them directly, there's just always a, a great path. If you, you just extend yourself out a little bit. Yeah, another great guy is, uh, it was like Bob Sobel, maybe they're related was, there's still a group out there. It's called the weathering forum. And these guys are just amazing artists. And one problem you run into on the internet and after a while it gets kind of tiresome is you want to be nice and encouraging, but just all the attaboys, good, bad, or indifference looks great. Looks great. Looks great. Um, yeah. and you don't learn anything from that. And 
so I'm on a weathering forum and I'm starting to submit some of my works and uh, everybody's going the same thing. Looks great. Looks great. And Gary Christensen goes, no, it doesn't that look good. <laughs> and there's uh, the guy you're looking for. Yeah. And uh, so he, and he said, uh, and he explained why it was very object. He was very objective about it. And that kind of stung because I knew he was right. And then the next day he sent me this, really long tutorial email step by step with photos he goes this basically what you put together looks like crap and let's start from the beginning and from layer one to layer two and he just walked me through the whole thing it was i cannot imagine anybody being uh, it was the nicest thing anybody could have done to put that much effort into it and i i still keep in touch with him today it's uh, but i really appreciated that but he did it right, which is, to, at least in my mind, he did it right, which is he gave you the brutal honesty you needed, but then he provided the support thereafter. And that's the It key. wasn't just like, this This is terrible, and then just leave you hanging and then wondering why. He gave it to you straight, which is what a lot of people need, especially you know trying to learn new new skills and, 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 and the whatnot. But then, he, you know, to help you walk through it. And then not, not just a... Well, it's 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 kind of walking a person down the path more than it is just pushing them down in the, in the ditch kind yeah. of thing, which well, is which is huge. Yeah, he was being a true instructor, and the thing that I found, yeah. and, and you probably have too, is that I've noticed, regardless of who it is, if you put in the age of internet, you're going to get the nitpickers, and the one thing that I've noticed with the nitpickers is they have one thing in common: they have never ever built a single thing themselves, and. Yeah. So you separate them from the guys like Gary and Bob that will say, okay, objectively, this is why this doesn't work. And this is the, let me teach you the right way to do it. So there's a big difference. Yeah. Heart of the teacher kind of people. Yeah. You know, they have that, they, they understand that. That's, that's so awesome. That's awesome to find those people. And you, you do that by putting yourself out there a bit and, you know, and, and then just like you said, it, it does sting when somebody, I, I know it from not so much a model railroading, although you know, I've, got, I've got good, some good, honest friends that'll say, eh, you know, and then, then they'll do the same thing. But even in photography and, and whether I'm photo doing train photography, sports photography or whatnot, it's kind of in the same realm. It's an art that is very subjective but yet there's some basic rules to go by to learn the rules first and then learn how to break them. But, and then have those types of people that, that can do that, whether they just say, ah, that's that, that photo stinks or what do you think? And then they start asking those questions and lead you down the path of learning from them. And, and, and the, it's just great that, you know, within all these hobbies, there's, there are the people that have the heart of the teacher. Yeah. So let's get back to, the, the 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 Lance Menheim story here. So we we talked about you're you're heading into the. I, I cut you off when we were talking about you. you you've just uh, took this survey at the at Cocoa Beach regarding you know what, what layout we're going to build, and you get the idea for Miami and 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 whatnot. Let's get back to that because that's that's wicked cool that you kind of did this you know kind of on a survey basis. <laughs> yeah, I think that. Uh... You look back at what themes get, uh, what themes draw you in. At least for me, I didn't realize it at the time, but I think there is a tie to really good filmmaking and uh, movie making. And I'm sure you remember, you know, the series Miami Vice, the Michael Mann, and just the whole mood uh, and aura of what he had put together. And the appeal of Florida was. Um, it was different because, you know, I grew up in Indiana, but no offense, Illinois to uh, Pennsylvania, it looks very much the same. And so we have, you know, vast swaths of the United States where, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, if you didn't have the lettering on the train, you wouldn't know if it was taken in Illinois, Ohio, Indiana, or, or, you know, the flatlands of Pennsylvania, whereas Miami was different. Nobody had really done that much with it. And then the other thing that I found is that, you know, through David Orr and uh, Bill McCoy and then Tom is Miami is like no other place 
in the world in terms of railroading, they were locked in 1955 at the time I started. I mean, you were still getting, there was so much rail activity down there, but it was still done the old way where you have these small industries that could barely hold a 60 foot car. Um, you know, they were just dropping these carload industries, uh, flagging in the streets. So, uh, you know, it was just a wonderful theme. And, uh, I lucked out. I just, early on ended up with a network of people that could really uh, give me the information to, you know, pull it together. Yeah. So you, so you build this, uh, the, the CSX, it, give me the right name just so I don't screw it up here. Well, the first one is in Miami, there's a lot of, um, as David explained to me, everything, railroaders name everything. And yep. there was this industrial, there was a bunch of industrial parks. One of them was called East rail because it's on the East side of the main very creative. So uh, <laughs> I looked at them and East Rail was kind of a small, interesting one. And so I did a, a small layout based on, uh, you know, kind of a composite of that, capturing the flavor, but not modeling it exactly. And I remember at the time, I'm like, I'm really enjoying this. I've never been, the, I, I guess I've always been kind of the outlier, not that worried about what people think. I'm like, on one hand, I don't care what people think, but this is really going to be the end of my railroad career. When people see this, I will be uh, totally ostracized. And uh, I was shocked when uh, I don't even remember whether it was model railroad planning or great model railroads that East rail came out and it just really struck a chord. You, you never know what's going to hit with people. And uh, right. uh, so it just kind of uh, took off from there. I think it's relatability, isn't it? I think that's what, where it, where it comes where people can see something and relate to it and whether, whether it be, um, you know, they see a railroad that they could build themselves or they can relate to the railroad you build or understand it. I think it's the relatability that kicks people off. Yeah, I think so, too. And, yeah, you know, we go through different phases of history and different different aspects of uh, you know, this social change. You know, and we hit this period where there was a trend towards larger layouts and uh, – we had this guy, this friend of mine named Tony Custer, who yep. will, will go down in history as the absolute best writer in model railroad history. He is a great communicator, and I'm convinced that he's like Bernie Kapinski, that he probably only sleeps one hour a night. So, I mean, he is just so productive. So he has this idea. He communicates it brilliantly. Al McClellan had the great idea that uh, Tony's a great writer. And then everybody uh, is jumping on the bandwagon. You got John Allen. But then all of a sudden, you run into a problem, and people realize um, I don't have uh, Tony Custer's energy or John Allen's uh, energy. I don't have his focus. I know I don't. Um, right. And so I've got this huge monstrosity, and it's collapsing because of its own weight. And it's a real problem because uh, you know this is a hobby of participation. And one of the things I've tried to advocate is, um, you know, let's be realistic about how much time you really have. And let's be realistic about how long some of these things take to build. And uh, far better, um, you know, to have a 8 by 8 l that actually gets built that you can engage in than a pile of half-finished uh, double-deck plywood in the basement that's grabbing uh, – you know, gathering cobwebs because you overran your coverage. Right. Well, I guess that's where, you know, we can, you know, where we lead into, you know, the, you talk about getting to know yourself, getting to know your limits and, you know, the, the, you know, fi figuring out your why. When did you start figuring out your, was this about the time that you start for yourself, started figuring out your why? Yeah, I think so. It's, uh, you know, as you get older, you, you need to be more self-reflective. And if I was going to give any, you know, any advice is you need to be a participant in the hobby and put aside how good you think it is or not. It's irrelevant because to be honest, nobody really cares. I mean, whether you're good, bad, or indifferent, um, you may get some attaboys, but let's be real. Nobody cares. The only person that matters is yourself. So you need to be engaged in the hobby, but if you want to get better, you have to have kind of an altruistic, uh, feedback system with yourself. In other words, recognize that what you did was your best effort at the time and enjoy it and celebrate it. 
but also look for ways that you can improve and rather than you know pumping your chest saying i'm all that um look at your work dispassionately say what could i do to improve that would enhance the experience for myself again it's not about anybody else because people really don't care not to be harsh but uh you know if this hobby is important to you and you get a lot out of it what can you do to improve and then you just gradually make notes and next time around um try to do a slightly better job in increments but if you just mindlessly start slapping stuff together decade after decade without you know talking to the guys like gary christensen and bob sobel and you know getting the feedback to slowly get better you won't improve yeah yeah you know it, there's a couple of things that I, I picked from what you were saying there it's like you, you know don't don't live for the dopamine hit of people liking your your stuff like it for you and and, and it really is you, you're building a layout for you and many a times i've had this conversation whether you know podcast or offline and people will start talking about their 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 layout and this is what i want to do but is it for you are you building it for me? Because if you're building it for me, I'm not, you know, it's not for me. It's for, it's for you. What do you want to get out of this? And I think that when I go back to this again, this book, Model Railroading is Art, I recommend anybody get it or borrow it from Joe Mammy if you know him well enough. <laughs> and uh, but, but start right at page four. And, and it's it, it's excellent. It's just that, you know, start really thinking about before you before you put your first screw on a board, uh, really start to figure out who you are and and, and, and your why, and you, you really nail it down here. It's it's fantastic. I'm working on a new book now that just kind of popped in my mind. I'm going to go into that in more detail. And a part of it is just observing yourself, but also watching other people. And it's interesting that uh, I enjoy operations to an extent, but the thing I've noticed is the passionate operators have – one thing in common they are exceptional writers and they're very prolific writers so you have this very small subset of the hobby that is excited and uh they're great writers so they they get a lot of information out there god bless them i don't know and so people tend to assume that they should have an equal level of a of passion for operations and either you do or you don't it doesn't matter but in looking at myself and my friends i'll drone on and on about operating this and that and my friends do uh too and then i'll go like well wait a minute when was the last time you had an operating session and it's like nine months ago and so what i'm noticing is people spend the majority of their time just building stuff, whether it's scenery, freight cars, or structures. So um, for me personally, and everybody's formula is different, I I would not like a layout that couldn't operate prototypically, but I'm starting to become more self-aware that, you know, the structures and the scenery is what I really enjoy. So when you put the, when you pick your theme and your design, it has to be a platform that supports your interests. So if you enjoy building structures, maybe you shouldn't build a prairie theme where you're going to go in 12 feet through the cornfields. Um, right. If you enjoy scenery and you like modeling cornfields, you don't need to put you know, a big city in the middle. You just have to know yourself and then come up with a platform that will allow you to spend the time you enjoy doing. So that gets right. into the, the why aspect of it, too. Yeah, knowing knowing you know what you love about even you know what do, what do you love about the prototype and what what really is your passion in the in the spots you love to go. I I had this conversation with with a with a friend and it was in the same thing. It was he was debating on two or three different railroads and I was like if you just answer the question, if you could go rail fan a, a, a place right now, where would it be? And he answered the question right. I said you know, where's your passion? You know, I said that if that's your passion, if that's what you really, if that's, that's where your heart is, you know, then you know, maybe that's where you need to go, you know, and just trying to help. But it's the only one person that can make a decision about what you want on your layout. And that's you, not, not really anybody else. Yeah. Well, you gave them really good. Uh, I think that's excellent advice. And I, there is, I, there, and you hit the nail on the head. I think the rail fanning does play a, uh, I mean, that's where the memories come from. And in this uh, book that I just kind of did on a whim, one of the, the things that I really recommend is you take your friend is 
I think it's really vital that you make a site visit. Um, just whatever it takes. And a lot of these places are pretty easy when you, to get to when you think about it. But it just gives you a totally different uh, perspective on your theme. It brings you a level of excitement. You can kind of connect what's on the layout with these images and memories you have in your mind. So I think that, um, you know, actually going to the physical place, even if it's for half a day is enough in most cases. Yeah, and, you know, and, and, and in turn, I guess in that same idea, if – the railroad if you're a modeler but you're a model railroader but the 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 train is kind of secondary to the scenery that's okay too just figure out where it is and then what what what, what's compelling to you about that area like there's a there's several railroads i can think of where the trains are secondary like they they're there is just a part of it but really it's them building you know basically a you know a, a diorama of sorts i guess more than a model railroad and that's certainly okay too. You just got to know what you what you love, and, and I just love this. You know, what you get into the the the, the psychological side of um, model railroading. It isn't just you know the how. Like I talked in the beginning, you've got a book that you know covers the why, and it's in the front of the book because all the how is after you figure out the why. And I think you brought up a good point about uh, I don't know where it was. It was at some train show, and I, I was just eavesdropping on a conversation, and one modeler was kind of being derisive of the other, saying, oh, it's just basically a diorama. And now I look back, and I'm like, what the hell difference does it make? Because yeah. uh, I'm embarrassed to say how many layouts I've got. I've got the one main one, but <laughs> the Los Angeles Junction is basically an operational diorama. It's got two turnouts. I've had so much darn fun with that because it's a platform to – model a city I love, which is Los Angeles. And so it, I'm just ag- agreeing with you, Ray, that uh, if your passion is building structures or scenery and you don't have that much track, um, what does it matter? And by the flip side, I've got friends that are passionate operators that have no scenery and that doesn't matter either. You know, like Steve King and, and John King were always laughing be- about their lack of scenery, but um it doesn't matter. They know themselves and what they're interested in. And, uh, so I, it's like you said, know yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing you also keep the, the, these, these ideas of one, you know, two turnout layouts and, you know, shelf layouts and then small shelf layouts. It, it seems like maybe one of the best things that's happened to the hobby to, to get to that concept that you don't need a basement empire to be a part of, the model railroading community and get yourself in. I think it's a fallacy to associate turnout count with sophistication. They're totally different. And it, here's an analogy, Ray. So how much does a turnout cost these days? 40 bucks. Well, prototype yep. turnout, I was told by, I think Dave Orr said they're, about, uh, somebody said they're 200, 250,000 each. Yeah. Just pocket change. Yeah. So, so let's say we have uh, Ray's Railroad, and yep. you have a street with eight industries all lined up, and none of them take a car more than every four or five months. So if you have to pay $250,000 per turnout, but they only take a car now and then, how many turnouts are you going to put on that line? None. You just run the track right by them. And on that one spur, and this is what they did on the switchback in Miami, you know, if it's – you got two cars that are need to be worked in April, you go down there. If there's one in the way, you move it out, and you go on to the next. Um, yeah. And things can get complicated with some of these grade crossings too, and then you add in car spots. So it's more the operational scenario and the number of car spots that are going to determine the amount of operations you get out of something, not – the turnout count well yeah and you know and, the, and that's the thing it's like even with my railroad and you know guys will you know i've, I've got scenarios set up and they go you know it'd be great if you just had one more turnout right here and it is exactly that well 250 grand to the to the to the uh to the <laughs> railroad and, we, and we'll be more than happy to install that turnout it's yeah you're absolutely right i i just love the fact that you're seeing more and more people um getting in the hobby where they used to before 
think that you used to have to have this massive amount of basement or you had to have a building or you had to take over half the the first floor or in a huge attic you can you can be in this hobby with six to eight feet by 12 inches to 24 inches if you can find a spare room and you've got a book on it layouts for spare rooms here um, eight realistic track plans for a spare room let's read the name right it, it's just there's so many ways to get in and then you see some guys out there i'll mention one like we, we interviewed tom johnson oh and yes a beautiful yeah, yeah. beautiful layout within a spare room of his house it's not a massive basement and he has so much fun going in there clicks the clicks the layout on and does a little switching and shuts it off and there's so many guys like that and it's just really i think revolutionized and 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 really opened up bigger uh doors for people to come into the hobby i think a part of it too is knowledge and being the pesty person i am i've accumulated a number of friends that are actually professional railroaders and they make the best operators in any session but you listen if you study maps and drawings of modern railroading and watch the videos the business side is much different um than they don't run it the way a model railroader does, but what they do if when you study it is pretty fascinating. For example, um, just this whole concept of team tracks and transload, which is what you see a lot of today. So just take an example of Brooklyn, um, New York, New Jersey, which was just in this month's RailPace magazine. They don't have that many turnouts. So what they did um, – there was this big vacant lot where an abandoned pier used to be, and they just ran a spur. So that's one turnout. But anybody on Long Island that needs to take a rail shipment, they don't need a spur. They just drop them off on this apron. They spot the cars of, you know, six center beams of lumber. B&M lumber comes from somewhere in Long Island with their trucks, and they haul them away. And yep. so it could be plastic pellets. It could be vegetable oil. So that one turnout is giving you all this car variety. Yeah. Um, then a different version of it, um, you have Omni Transload in um, Miami. If you look at the structure, you'd laugh. It's a box. It's maybe 30 feet deep and several hundred feet long. It's a cube. On the street side, you have 25 garage doors. And on the rail side, you have seven, eight loading doors. So you have this totally boring cube with truck doors on one side and rail doors on the other and you think what could be more boring than that well transload means that every one of those doors is a different customer they rent it out so when fec comes in they can't just dump that box car at the first door because every door is a different customer one is taking lumber one is um is frozen maybe a reefer so they have to come in and every one of those doors is basically a separate industry. So for that one turnout, you know, if you have six cars, they have to be, you have to shuttle them around and reblock them to get them in the right door. So now you have something interesting there. Yeah. One building, one turnout, and you've got a great little, little switching opportunity in, in a, in a model railroad. Yeah that you could probably spend quite a bit of time, especially if you know, try to have to put them in an order by door. I mean, what an awesome you know way to do it. And you don't have to, that's not a lot of heavy lifting there. You got to build one, build one structure and lay track with one turnout and you, and you're, and you're on your way. There was a guy, named, he's passed away sadly, but there was a conductor uh, with CSX named CSX named TJ Bissett. And he would, he was, the railroaders always give the best talks. So I'm at Cocoa Beach, and he's talking about this place somewhere in Florida called Saddle Creek, um, which is a logistics warehouse. And he was explaining how it worked. And there was like 20 doors. And uh, his boss was complaining. He said, why is it taking you all day? He said, of course it's taking me all day because it's 20 different customers. I've got this cut of cars. Some of them are still being unloaded, so I have to move them out of the way. Then I need to put my cars back there. I need to respot the ones that were loading. And the light just went off after that talk that you've got this one spur, and it took this crew all day to work it. 
It's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, and and for yeah, and for taking information from the prototype and applying it to the to the model railroad, you got all the information you need right there to build yourself a great little switching layout for sure. Yeah, I know that's what I would do. You know, and talk about my layout and I, I, I knowing what I know now, kind of what the things you were talking about early on. You know, that you go, oh, I wish I would have done it this, or I, you know, oh boy, I don't really want to share what I did here, but um. I think mine would be less industries with more activity at each. Like you don't need seven industries with them all piled on top of each other. You can do one and just have a lot of action happening at one, like a grain mill. There's so much you could have going on at a grain mill or a paper mill or with different commodities coming in, product going out. You don't need a ton of structures to do it. You can do one structure like you just mentioned and have so much action at it without thinking you need all this stuff and i you know in my sense i wish i had less stuff and maybe someday i will get to a point where i just start taking stuff off there and and uh or spreading it out a little bit maybe but uh it's it definitely changes the philosophy but it's all we can't go back in time and say i wish it would be nice if all aspects of life we could say okay when i was 21 i wish i knew everything i knew at age 62 and then i could start over but it doesn't work that way so it's just a it's just a learning process, and uh, I don't think you'd want to know it all. It's nice to know that at your age, there's still things you'll be learning, you know, 10 years oh, from yeah. now. Yep, up until Doc Brown finally builds that DeLorean, I think we're kind of stuck here, and <laughs> we just got to you know, exactly what you said. We got to learn from what we've done here and, you know, just lose, use them as opportunities for sure. That's for sure. I, it's interesting you were talking about the, the switching layout, and I get more ideas for blogs and I have time to write them, but – one of them was on the subject of convenient tastes. We cannot con- we cannot control what we're interested in, but it's more convenient to be interested in some things than others. And I'll give you an analogy. So mm-hmm. let's say that you live in Miami, Florida, and your passion is snow skiing. That is not a convenient interest. Nope. Now, if you live in Miami and your passion is uh, fishing, that's convenient. Right. So – making the leap to model railroading people love if you love the uh operational aspect of container trains going a thousand miles from point a to b to c to d i totally get why you find that fascinating it is not a convenient interest because it does not lend itself to a 20 by 20 foot basement whereas a switching layout uh does lend it but it's kind of a a pointless uh thought experiment but it's just more convenient to be interested in switching one area it lends itself better to the limited space we have yeah want to talk a little bit about uh you mentioned about you know the writing and stuff you mentioned the blog and in writing and you certainly have dove yourself right into writing and uh i got a question about it because i went to amazon and I, I search your name and I see these books, how to operate a modern era switching layout, how to build a switching layout, how to design a small switching layout, how to design a model railroad, model railroading is art, eight realistic track plans for a spare room, stucco and pastels. I'm maybe missing one or two, but how does Amazon's algorithm put Tom Kolmoski at the top when I search Lance Minheim? How did, how did he crack the Amazon algorithm? Tom is not a very honest person. He will. He has learned <laughs> that by spending, by throwing money around, he can get his name at the top of any list. So, uh, <laughs> he doesn't like to make an issue of it, but he, he's actually a, a member of the Mexican drug cartel, and he takes those ill-gained profits and he bribes people at Amazon. I think that's pretty much how it happens. This may, this may be just become the most controversial episode of Around the Layout that we've had. We're outing Tom as a me, as a member of the Mexican tar- cartel. Oh, great! Oh boy, I thought that was pretty funny. I was like, well, "How did Tom get in here?" But you you've written all these books. Where was your start? In you know, when you start to share this out, you talked about your blog and in. But where where do you get this? Where you've gone from all this stuff you've learned to now putting it into print? What what, what was the pivot point there? I would like to say I could answer that. I have no clue, Ray. I mean, it was just, uh, I get all these ideas. I've always enjoyed writing. And uh, if I get an idea, I write it down. And sometimes it irritates people and sometimes it doesn't. And uh, there was no uh, 
turning point. I think part of it was just the advent of the internet. So it gives you this platform for free expression, which is good, bad, uh, and indifferent. Uh, I mean, there's just so much stuff out there. Some of it's great and most of it's not. So I think yeah. part of it was just, you know, the platform presented itself and, uh, this, the platform through Amazon is, uh, of self publishing is really, uh, really wonderful. That just makes it easier. Um, also, but there was no grand plan uh, going in. In hindsight, if I'd known how it was going to turn out 10 years ago, I probably would have written a little bit more. But if, if you take somebody like uh, David Balducci and he writes a novel, he's going to get a big hit. And then a year from now, they're going to, the book is totally forgotten. So for that right. genre, um, it's kind of pump and dump. And what I did not realize at the time is model railroad how to books, particularly self published, don't work that way. You don't get a big pump in the beginning, but they just chug along year in and year out. And had I understood that, and there was no way to know, I would have been more consistent um, in cranking them out, but too late now. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, I always say, you know, how do you, how do you figure out when you have a book in, in you and you, you've got several that you've, you've published and, and put out there and in, in the information sharing, uh, via the, either the internet or in published. And to me, I'm still a tangible guy. I like to put my hand on a, on a physical book and look at it like what you have here. And, um, I just find it amazing that, you know, not only did you have a book in you, you've got several that you've, you've shared out, um, guys like Tony Custer. I'm sure that that was kind of inspiration to you and Jeff Wilson to see that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, both, like I said, I, Jeff was my first editor and you know, it was, I'm still working with them now. I just finished a, a book on structures for him, but, uh, I don't know. I guess it's the, there's a sense of nostalgia with old friendships. It's kind of cool to say, all right, this is the person that was my first editor that I worked with, you know, four decades ago, and now we're still working together. I mean, that's kind of uh, cool. And, and Tony's fun. He's an interesting character. You never have to, and I would tell him this, if he was sitting next to me, he'd agree to it. You never have to wonder what's on his mind. <laughs> and if he doesn't like something, he will, he will not sugarcoat it. And a, a funny story with uh, Tony is I had written something for model railroad planning. And sometimes I get an idea, I just fired it off and I totally forget about it. And, you know, lead times can be a couple years. And so then I forgot about it. Model railroad planning comes in and I see my article and I'm like, damn, Lance, I did not realize you were such a good writer. I said, <laughs> this is impressive. And then, uh, so I'm, I'm strutting around like a rooster for a couple of days. And then it's, it's like, wait a minute, something just doesn't jibe with this. So I go back and I pull up the original manuscript and damn it, Tony had gone back. He, he trashed everything I wrote. He rewrote the whole article and put my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> Which was, I mean, he's a great writer. Yeah. So, so, so now I'm out with it there you go well hey you know it, it, it's uh writing is not easy you know and, and trying to convey what you have in your mind whether you know speaking's not easy you know and, and trying to get an idea out and then trying to write it in a way that's compelling and uh interesting and and in sense gets your idea across it's it's such a challenge but uh always good to have somebody to help and, and help wordsmith some things up yeah, he and Andy Sprandio was really good too. Um, but yeah, those both those guys were just amazing editors. In terms of saying, kind of going through the the gobbledygook and trying to s figure out what you were actually trying to say and putting it into some type of cohesive sentence, they're both uh, very good at that. Absolutely. One before we uh, wrap up here, there was one thing I wanted to try to touch on a little bit here and. I noted in the in the uh, the end of the book, you mentioned that you have an engineering degree, and you mentioned that earlier about uh, engineering. And it seems to me to be like a very objective kind of thing in engineering. And then the subject, what, what what's the balance? I guess is the the question I'm asking. You know, 
being a subjective art of model railroading, there's some objective rules, obviously, but do you, do you find that any bit challenging to try to in that subjective world with, with an objective kind of uh, education and mindset? What a great question. And the one thing I've been talking to you, Ray, I'm realizing that the same, you and I are fascinated by the exact same things and that I'm really fascinating by this play between uh yeah, you, the left and right brain, which they've proven is not true, but you do have people that are tend to be more um, technically inclined versus more artistically c- combined. And there are some that have both, like a friend Toga Urbora, who is somebody you should have on the show, who's got uh, both. Um, the engineering degree was – I was pre-wired from – birth, I think, to have uh, more of artistic leanings. And uh, I was given advice, which I think was good at the time, is it's nice to have a job so you can have a paycheck and buy groceries. And maybe you should get an engineering degree because um, you'll always be employable. And that was true. Um, And even at the time, you know, I went to kind of a liberal arts high school and then in engineering school, there are no liberal arts. It's all, there's nothing. It is, yeah. it is nonstop math and science. And it's, it just doesn't, and I could almost feel the physical um, unwiring of my brain. That's not a, maybe that sounds dramatic, but I could feel the difference. And uh, I think it really hurt me. Um, I used engineering on the technical side a lot. But uh, I think in life, the artistic side will take you um, further. And one of my ramblings, which I'm sure people, I can just see the eye rolls when uh, uh, I say this, but uh, I firmly believe it, is they have proven that exposure and immersion to the arts totally rewires your brain. They've done, there's no doubt. They've done the scans. The scientists have done it. Um, you know, they took a group of uh, medical interns and split them into two groups. And the uh, one half, they just left them status quo. And the other half, they totally immersed them in the arts. And then they came back at a time period. Um, I don't know if it was like a year or whatever. And they compared their ability to uh, diagnose illnesses. And no surprise, the one that had been immersed in the arts was far measurably superior. It's like 15 or 20 percent more accurate medical diagnoses. Um, and we can use that to your advantage. I think that uh, particularly in model railroading, um, the more you can immerse yourself in the arts, the better modeler you're going to be, the more ideas you're going to have. And that can be um, the beauty of it is um, you can involve your family in doing that. Um, go to art museums, walk through them, you know, take architectural tours, um, you know, go to the great uh, cathedrals and walk around the great gardens. And I do study it, but I don't even think you have to. It's just a matter of being exposed to that degree of excellence over time. Um, you will become a much better uh, model. You'll become a better writer. You'll have better ideas. Um, you know, it's just something I, I recommend to everybody. And as soon as I say it, it's like, oh, God, here he goes again. But, <laughs> but it, 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 it hits, you know. And, and for me, I know who I am. I know my personality. I find myself to be, you know, in life, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a rules guy. I love my rules. I run a roller hockey league. I love my rule sets and officiating where you're following rules. But you find more and more as you get more subjective, it does, it does have an impact on your objective mindset where you start to say, okay, well, there's rules, but then there's, you know, the, 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 there's just, I don't even know how to say it. I'm not, I don't have a, a psychological or you know, any kind of degree in this. I just know that you, you, what you're saying is right. You know, the more you expose yourself to subjective things and throw the rule book out in your head and you kind of look at things at a broader perspective, it, it really does change how you look at things. Although I don't know, I think it, I would say it's more of a building than an either there, there or either or. So let's say you took somebody that had a, 
a more technical mindset. Um, I would say you can leave all of that in place, but you're going to get much farther ahead if you augment that with the artistic side as opposed to digging deeper and deeper into the more technical side. So it's going to make you a better uh, technician as well. You know, you, you had mentioned that book, The Model Railroading is Art, and uh, that was such a blast to write. And about halfway through it, I was like, I just don't, I don't have enough knowledge to finish this book. So I stopped it. And I live in Washington, D.C., where they have the Smithsonian. And there's a group here called Smithsonian Associates, which does nothing but put on lectures. And so I enrolled in that program and I just started taking their courses. And it was by far the most positive uh, experience I've ever been through. And I did not take any, I did not take a single how-to course. I didn't take any drawing courses, any painting courses. Um, it was all theory, um, visual literacy, composition, uh, color theory. Um, you go in and they just pick any artist and uh, they'd spend an hour just breaking down their paintings. It's just fascinating. It was just a, you know, just a very, uh, very positive experience. And every city that has museums has those. I mean, you can go in and off, usually they're free. Um, right. You know, they'll just give you a tour and um, just go through these types of things. Well, you're certainly covering it in the book. And, you know, model railroading is art about some of these things, like even just, you know, how to look at how to look at things you know, in a different way and just seeing the detail versus just seeing the overall. And the one I, I, I saw in here, you were talking about a loading dock and you, the first picture you have is just a single gray color, but then you have below it and you're, you're making the point there's, it isn't just gray, there's grays, there's dark color, the blacks, there's some rust color, whatever. It, it, it's just, you're, you're seeing more than just what, the, the over the surface you're looking at it in a in a different way and i think that's that really is an art way of looking at it like what like you've been talking about well that's one of the things i learned from these art history courses where you i think people tend to think that these these greats just they pick up a brush and they're good the, yeah. the thing that i've learned is how unbelievably hard these guys work and study i mean and this goes back you know, for hundreds of hundreds of years. I mean, there were art schools, you know, in the 1600s and 1700s, and these guys would just spend hours uh, in classes. And you take somebody like Hopper, he would look at a uh, a scene or a subject, and he would study it for a couple of days and just look at it before he even picked up a brush. So um, yeah. you're right, and it comes with practice. If you just sit there and, and look at something, eventually you'll start picking up on you know what's putting it together absolutely lance there is so much that we could talk about and i like i said i i've got i've got a pile of notes here so we're gonna have to get you back on the show we, we we've got a lot and of course with you you're putting a new book together we'll have to uh, get you back we'll talk about that but i really appreciate you being on the podcast and coming and starting to share your story and and, and i just love the connection of why it was so much fun to, to kind of to, to go through that with you tonight well, I appreciate you having me on, Ray. It was a lot of fun. So just uh, just drop me a note, and uh, you know it's easy enough to do. Just you know, shoot me a line and let me know when you want to do it next, and we'll make it happen. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Around the Layout. You'll find more about today's show on our Facebook page, facebook.com backslash around the layout. Learn more about the show and check out past and future episodes on our website, aroundthelayout.com. And send us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you around the layout at gmail.com. Thanks again for hanging out with us around the layout.